What can farming teach us about the Bible? That's what we're going to talk about today. Farming is a profession of hope. Brett Bryan. Today we're going to look at the points of view of farmers when it comes to biblical stories. And someone wrote the book that I really enjoyed reading. It is called Scouting the Divine, Searching for God in Wine, Wool, and Wild Honey by Margaret Feinberg. She did something that I think is really interesting in general, is that she decided that she was going to go out and look for farmers that she could learn more from. She wanted to ask questions about the Bible from the point of view of people who are farmers. So many of the parables are about sowing seeds, about farming plants, about separating weeds from wheat. And because people farmed, a lot of the parables would be understandable to the very people who were out there producing the food in the time of the Bible. So much of agriculture has to do with the Bible because it is, first of all, I think one of the most fundamental things God had us do. When we came into the garden, we became gardeners. Then we became farmers. Farming is still important today as it was any other time. So her desire to go out and try to learn more from these farmers brought her a ton of inspiration. I really enjoyed reading this book, just not even from an educational standpoint, but just the warmth and that getting back out into nature, growing food, the most basic parts of humanity. So she said that when she reads scripture and she said, quote, when scripture comes alive in our heart, it doesn't inform us as much as it transforms us. And she's discovering, she said, that faith isn't about becoming good, but instead it's about becoming, she said, godly characters in the great story. She views the Bible as an adventure, chock full of plots, stories, historical insights, and literary beauties. That's her quote. I agree with her. You know, the more I'm reading the Bible myself, the more I realize how interesting it is. You know, it was always that thing like, I should really read the Bible more, or I really should study it more. This is really important. And then now that I'm doing it in the Bible in Small Steps podcast, I realize when you study the Bible slowly, it is intriguing. It's even interesting from the point of view of the fact that Jesus talks to different people in different ways. Some people he says, hey, follow me. Other people he'll say, do this, this, and this. To, to Bartimaeus, he said, go your way. And you know what? Bartimaeus's way became Jesus' way. He knows the thing to say. And so I find, too, that in all of these, once we get into the Old Testament and everything, kings and queens were tied to the food production of this nation. David was a shepherd. The most basic of types of careers you had in the time of Israel. So she said that she spent time, even her opening paragraph, which obviously I can't read to you, Oh, man, it was just, like I said, a really great account of what the Bible can teach us and show us this, this humanity trying to reach out to God and missing the point that God is instead reaching out to us. And she says in the end, quote, in some ways, aren't we all scouting the divine? She, in the course of this book, visits four kinds of farmers, and we're going to just talk about them briefly. Again, I really recommend this book because it just filled me with such warmth in so many ways. So the first one she talks to is a woman who is a sheep herder or sheep farmer. She talks about, you know, the various passages of Jesus being the good shepherd. What does that mean to be a good shepherd? You know, Jesus says, knowing his sheep and that the sheep knows his voice. But when she talks to the sheep farmer about her experience, suddenly it becomes much more deep to her. It's not just about sheep versus shepherd. It is about a shepherd doesn't just say, okay, there's my sheep, blah, blah, blah. They like to eat over here. They like to eat this. I have to bring them in every night. The shepherd knows their sheep, each individual one of them. My friend and I, when we did our hike in England, we ended up having arranged places where we would stay. And one of these places we stayed was a sheep farm. And it was interesting to me because these people, when you talk to them about their sheep, they knew each individual one of them. Now, granted, they're painted and they have numbers, which makes them much more identifiable, but they get 
Number 10, he's a little skittish. He does not rush in with the food because there's so many other sheep there. He needs to have a little space. Sheep number three, boy, that guy's bold. He just barges in and he'll barge anyone else out. He knows them piece by piece. And in this case, that's what she's saying too. The sheep can get petty. They can bump each other, she says. And sometimes she has to go in and stop fighting. (laughs) Sometimes you think, boy, Jesus is there too. Okay, why are y'all fighting? Stop fighting. And he'll stand between people to do that. Knowing your sheep that well, and when you have to step in and when you can let them solve their own problems, that's the first part of it. And so for her in writing this book, she imagined King David among his sheep with his flock out in the field and, you know, sitting on the hell side. I think the other part of it, too, is that you realize that when you have a shepherd, in the case of someone like David, and he was with his sheep all the time, they love a hillside. They love this particular area. They know the place to sit when you come over to this river. They not only learn their sheep very well, but they learn the land very well. And there's this love of the land that goes along with it. And interestingly enough, when the prophet Nathan came to convict David of what he had done with Uriah and Bathsheba, he used a parable of a sheep. One man had a huge flock and a poor man had nothing but just one lamb. And he loved that lamb and adored the lamb. And then over time, the lamb became part of his family. And then one day the rich man came and stole that lamb. Of course, David's indignant. How dare someone do that? And you know what? It was David. King David had everything. And Uriah was a dedicated, faithful servant, not even a Jew, yet serving proudly for King David's kingdom. And what did David do? Steal the one thing that Uriah loved the most. So having sheep parables meant something to David and convicted him of his own sin. Even in 2 Samuel 24, 17, David compares ruling people over ruling sheep because he says to God, behold, it is I who have sinned. It is I who have done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand be against me and my father's house. He is taking blame and saying, my people didn't do anything wrong. You can see that farmer still in David. He still understands that relationship. And we see it too, you know, in a court, see it a lot in the Psalms of David. He talks about it throughout the Old Testament. We're going to see it time and time again of people talking about their flocks. We'll see it in Cain and Abel. We will talk about it in Pharaoh and the crops and the animals that they had then. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, being a shepherd was a part of being part of God's people. And all the parallels talk about leadership as being a shepherd, and then Jesus being the ultimate shepherd, the good shepherd. Because obviously, people, we screw up at times and aren't quite the shepherds we would hope to be. We don't lead our families or our businesses or the people around us in the way we would hope to. But Jesus is the good shepherd who always does the right thing. And then the very last part of sheep in the Bible, of course, comes in the prophecy of Jesus and being the Lamb of God and being the ultimate sacrifice, the unblemished, the perfect, the Lamb that did no wrong on earth being given up as a sacrifice for all of us. And all the time, Peter the apostles trying to stop this. No, 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 this is not going to happen. And yet it does have to happen. And Jesus knows it has to happen. Fulfilling all the prophecies that go along with the shepherd's imagery. She said that those include Hosea, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Nahum, Zechariah, and there's even one in Amos. She said, quote, an offbeat guy in the Bible is a shepherd turned prophet. And so when we look even at the Messiah's line, it is a shepherd list of Israel. So that ultimate sacrifice that comes at the very end is all about lambs, all about being a shepherd. And so we can understand it better. And this woman, Lynn, who is the shepherd she talked to, understands it better than ever because she understands how her sheep are, when her sheep are sick, when they're not treating each other properly and how to keep them healthy. She is the expert on that. And God, he's the expert of that with us too. 
They bring up the point as well that dependence is a part of it, that the sheep depend on the shepherd. What would happen to the sheep if the shepherd decided to go on vacation and leave the sheep with no one? What if the shepherd leaves his people leaderless and without a protector? They would die. They need the shepherd to thrive. They need the shepherd to be there to protect them, to bring his dogs into the area to keep the wolves out. I watch a lot of homesteading shows because I'm just kind of interested in homesteading in general. And what happens is the people go out and they buy a bunch of sheep and they say, oh, we're going to eat the sheep. You know, we're going to live off the sheep and then we're going to use the wool and we're going to make all this wool stuff. And guess what happens? The predators come in right away because they didn't provide protection for their sheep and they get eaten all the time. And with Jesus being the good shepherd, he is the one sitting in the field watching us, his flock, providing protection, but also rejoicing then when that one sheep that wandered away comes back. Also, the skills of shepherding taught David to be a good leader because, again, all the different things, the protection, the guarding, the warding. But where did David get to be such a good slingshot thrower? He learned it from sheep herding because you have to be able to fight off the wolves. That skill came in pretty handy when he faced off with the Philistines. I thought the interesting point is that she also said that she says that when you're a sheep herder, you learn how to lead from the front, to be the, you know, the, the tip of the spear, to be that point in front of your sheep. Whenever sheep are pushed, she said that they get afraid, they get anxiety, they don't like to be chased from behind, and it just makes them run. You'll notice the sheepdogs don't do that. They circle them, they nudge them this way, and they nudge them that way. Being a sheep herder is about being a leader too. One of the things that you'll notice about sheep and how they get into danger is they get scared, they get startled, they get lured in by something. You know, they're standing there, and they're eating with the other sheep, and then they go, hmm, look at that clover over there, I think, and they wander off. They're easily distracted, and suddenly, like the sheep I saw in England that got me all teary, suddenly there's a baby lamb standing in a field all by himself because he missed the fact everybody else went in. Sheep just fall prey to all sorts of things that are their own doing. That's part of it too. There's, you know, sickness and illness and things that happen with sheep that they can't control, just like us. But part of it too is that sheep are very distractible, very willing to run off because something temporarily startled them. That's us too. We see something or something happens in our lives and we give up on God because something bad happened to us. I know bad stuff happens to all sorts of people, but now it happened to me and I'm leaving God. Bad things happen and we become that startled sheep who walks away from God, either out of fear or the promise of some really good clover over yonder or because something just was flashing in the light and we just want to go over and check it out. We don't have the attention span we think we do. We don't focus on God like we think we should. And so then that's when it comes in that we wander away. But it's that good shepherd who, who comes over to bring us back. He calls his sheep. He leads them, she says. He goes before them and the sheep follow him. And no matter how good a shepherd leads his sheep, there's always going to be some that just do the wrong thing. Same with us. The second part of the book then goes into talking about farmers who grow fruits. And we have seen in the Bible in Small Steps all sorts of parables when it comes to the parable of the sower. We found out that Mark has its own parable where it talks about how the farmer plants a seed but doesn't know why the seed grows. In the same way, we plant the seeds of faith and we don't understand why they grow, why they don't grow, but God does. We trust in God. He also talks about the concept of the first fruits. You know, when we, I was always told, have first fruits, that means that when we donate to God's church, we give the first fruits. The idea is, is imagine you're in charge of an apple farm and you start seeing apples spring up on your tree. You go and you get those fruits and sell them and bring that first money in to the church. Why the first? Because now you're trusting on God that the other fruits will come next. If you give the last fruits, you say, oh, that makes more sense to do the last fruits because then I'll know I have 
not just 20,000 apples this year as a bumper crop. I have 40,000 apples. So I'm going to give more when I do it at the end. But when you're doing it at the end, you're giving out of what you know instead of giving out of faith. Isn't that interesting? So we spend our time on the farm hoping that when that first fruit comes, there's more to come. And putting that trust in God, he will take care of us with that first fruit. One thing about farming that she talked about when she talked about a farmer is the farmer learns how to sow the seed, learns what's going to affect the crop. You know, there's always diseases that are there, but then goes into there are harmful weeds and both the vines that are weeds and the trees produce their own different kinds of fruit. And we talked a lot about that in the parables, that in the very end of time, Jesus is going to separate the weeds from the wheat because that's when you do it. You can't do it when it's young. You may kill the young plant or it may not be what you think it is. That's in my case. I look at my backyard and I look at something. I'm like, okay, so are you a perennial flower or are you a weed? I can't honestly tell you until it blooms. And then I'm like, okay, now I know what you are because now I see what fruit you produced. In that case too, being able to separate the bad things from the good. The other interesting thing I found, and I don't think it was mentioned in this book, was when you had the farmer and he planted his seeds in his farm, the enemy came and planted the weeds. Farmers never plant weeds intentionally. They never do anything to hurt their own crop. And Jesus also never does anything to hurt us. But it is the enemy that does that. It is the enemy that puts in the things that will draw us away cause us to get choked out, cause us not to get enough sun and enough water to grow that seed of faith inside of us. But instead, the enemy is trying to keep it from happening all the time. So all those parables of farming and growing reign big in the gospel. I think that in retrospect, sowing had more to do with the parables than anything else. Then they go into talking a little bit about Genesis and how When we start thinking about Genesis, that we have heaven and earth, then light was separated from darkness, then the water was separated from the sky, then on the third day, there was land and there was sea separated. You know, so basically, God is going through this process of creating something in Genesis and filling it. We're going to create the earth and then I'm going to fill it with light. We're going to create the earth and we're going to give it water. We're going to create the earth and the water, and we're going to make plants. And then we're going to create the plants and make people. He is filling his land. So that is what I said before, a system. It's not that just God created the snakes and the spiders and us and lambs and armadillos. He is creating systems so that the water goes up and then it comes back down. He is creating flowers so that the bees can pollinate them, so the bees pollinate our vegetables too, and all the things that we eat, and there's a circle of life going on there. He is the person who took something that had no systems in place and put all of the self-sustaining systems into action. And that's what I think is the most amazing part. And the fact that the very first job God gave us was to tend the garden. And That means tending the garden means you're going to keep it alive. You're going to look after things. You're going to name it. That was a big job that Adam had. He was going to go name everything. But when you become an expert, again, as a gardener, it's like becoming a farmer where you know what it is you sowed and you know what it is you're going to reap. And we see those parables, too, about reaping and sowing very prominent in the Bible. And then when it came time for the various Holidays, most of them have to do with agriculture in some sense. Most of the laws and the rules that came in through Deuteronomy and Numbers had to do with rules of agricultural life. What do you do if your oxen does X, Y, and Z? And so being a farmer was there right at the very beginning and then later used as parables from Jesus. She asked her farmer, talking about like, how do you know about the wheat and the tear? That's going to be the wheat and the weed, the good crop and the bad crop. And she said that you can't tell by looking at it what it is. 
you can grab it and sort of squeeze it and crush it and find out if it's real or not real. But we can't just look at something and know it. And then Aaron said that he feels like people are like that too, where you have to grab something, squeeze it, crush it around, and then you know what it's made of. And you don't really want to do that. You don't want to destroy the crop when it's young or before it's known. Again, you do that much later. And that's what Jesus is talking about. You want to make sure that you understand what it is before you crush it and destroy it. I think the other part that really intrigued me about this presentation, too, was talking about how people, everybody, he says, works during the harvest and there's a camaraderie among farmers. I watched that farmer show on Amazon Prime about the Clarkson farm. He's the British uh, television host who bought a farm and he's learning slowly but surely what it means to be a farmer. And when he gets in trouble, everyone comes to help. They get their tractors, they get their materials together and they help him when he's in trouble. Same thing like he would do to help everybody else. But he's new, so he's in trouble more often than everyone else. But he does a good job of explaining the process and the hard work. And so that's the idea, too, is that everyone has to work. Everyone has to be there. And Jesus said it in his time that the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. And he hoped that workers were going to come out and do his bidding. And then afterwards, he called his apostles, who did come out, and did what he asked them to do, which was to go out. He said that there's just too many ways of getting out of work now. And a person who doesn't want to work will know how to get out of it. And in this case, you can't have that in farming. You need everybody to, to work and be a part of the process. I think that we get used to the modern day office life. Oh, I'm kind of having a down day. I didn't sleep very well. I'm going to call in and have a mental health day. But you know what? In the farm, when you meet farmers and you know farmers, and I grew up in an agriculture area, I live in an agricultural area, you understand there's no resting because you're having a mental health day. In fact, half the time when they're very sick, they still have to do the things. The cows need to get milked. The farm needs to be reaped if it's reaping season. The fertilizer has to go down if it's fertilizer season. People have to work. There's no getting out of it. And if you get out of it, your crops will die. You will lose an entire crop. And you know that when a farmer loses his entire crop, it's pretty much the end of things. It is so hard to keep going. It is like one of those devastating things. And so the final quote of that was, Paul says, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. And that's Galatians 6, 9. Being a farmer, whether it's going to be a real farmer or a metaphorical farmer harvesting God's crop, growing people, growing seeds, planting seeds, if we don't grow weary, that crop's going to come in. People will come to God. We just can't get weary and we can't get tired and we can't call in for a mental health day. And we have to be there doing his work because God always includes us in his work. And so, my challenge to you is think about. I guess any agricultural experience you know. I know that's easy for me. I live in an agriculture area and I grew up with farmers in my school. But think about how hard their lives are and how hard their work is and how important it is and why it is that God used agriculture to explain most of his stories. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Please remember to check out a better life in small steps.com. That is the home site for all my podcasts. And it is a brand new blog. And while I'm the talker, my best friend, Em, she is the writer. She's great at it. And she is starting that off as a blog. There are three articles there already. So please give it a chance. Check it out. There's going to be all sorts of articles about good living, happiness, just the quality of all the things that life brings us. And remember, our step through the farm fields starts with small steps.